Let's go to Matthew 9. Verse 35 to 38. And Matthew 10, verse 1. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send our workers into his harvest field. And Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. In the whole of Matthew 8, running up to this passage, there's been miracle after miracle. Jesus was casting out demons, healing the sick, healing leprosy, healing the blind and the mute, healing the woman with the issue of blood, doing all kinds of miracles, even healing Healing, uh, healing, the, healing the woman, healing a paralyzed man, and raising the dead girl to life. So this passage is set up against the context of all the miracles he just did. And the passage reveals one important truth and reality. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This passage is sandwiched between the demonstration of the kingdom and the sending out of the disciples. Essentially saying, I have demonstrated the kingdom. I've showed you what the power of God looks like to so many people, but it is not enough. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. We need some more workers. It's not enough. Crop harvesting is intensive on labor, like real crop har harvesting. And then Jesus goes and says, here, I'll give you access to my power. I'll send you out as well. That's why it says in Matthew 10 verse 1, you can go and do it too. Today, there are three very important questions I want to pose to all of us. What do you see, what moves you, and what will you do? I'm going to repeat that. What do you see, what moves you, and what will you do? What do you see? In Matthew 9, Jesus saw the crowds. It says this word, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What evidence would cause Jesus to say the harvest is plentiful? My husband and I, we like traveling whenever we can in season and we've visited many great cities. And one of the things we like to do when we're in one of these cities um, other than, than sightseeing is that we usually ask God, God, what is your heart for this city? We go and visit some of the churches. We always like visiting churches in other countries because, you know, we want to see what the spiritual climate is in the nations of the world. And we walk down the streets and we would try and sense what God is saying, what His heart is. And behind the blinding lights and the seeming economic growth and the beautiful buildings, he also shows us the reality of society, the, deter the deterioration of society. We see the people on the trains when we were in New York. And though, you know, poker face looking, you can feel, you can sense their spirit. They're stressed and distressed. We walk down the streets of Hong Kong, we see so many people and they walk so fast. They walk way faster than us for some reason. The escalators go double time, the escalators here. 
It goes so fast that when we came back and, set, and went on an escalator, we were like, what's so slow on We don't see many crowds here because, you know, we don't walk outside a lot because we drive. The stress is in the traffic jam here. We see a lot of cars. But it's everywhere. It's everywhere. There are realities underneath the surface. When we were in New York, we would go to these churches and and before we actually get into the church, we have to go through security, you know, like the airport. We go through scanners, they check your body, check your bags to go to church, to go home. There's a reality out there. The world is dark. The world is dark. But amidst all of this, one thing we see in common in every city and nation, many are lost. We see, we see a cry for hope in a hopeless world. We see distressed people. We see people just running the rat race, just trying to make more and more money. People in Hong Kong, really, they look so focused. I'm going there to make money. You can see it on their faces. It's a very Chinese thing. But you see, it's not just now that this is all happening. It was even back then during Jesus' time when the Jews were under oppression of the Romans. They were under great distress. They were being oppressed. The Bible, even in the Old Testament, speaks of all these things. That men's hearts will fail. Nations will be divided. Tribulation. Many will fall away. The love of many will grow cold. There will be wars and rumors of wars. Nations will come against nations. So it's not like it's just happening now. Darkness has always been there. And it's getting darker. But Jesus, he saw the crowds. But he didn't react to the darkness. He saw hope. He saw life. He saw an answer. He saw a solution. And he gave that solution to the disciples. The harvest is plentiful. He was speaking from spiritual sight. It's a heavenly one. It's not a natural one. Where the disciples were, they were, the disciples were looking in the natural. He was looking from a totally different realm. And he saw something there. He saw an answer and a solution. John 4 says, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes. And look at the fields, they are white, ripe for harvest. He looks at the situation of darkness and he calls out the gold. He calls out the opportunity. I think many of us, the natural reaction to darkness would be to react to the darkness. But Jesus is saying in the darkest times, get your eyes off the conditions. The harvest is being ready in the darkest times. Get your eyes off the conditions and start seeing like me. Jesus sees that the darker the generation, the wider the harvest, the darker the times, the more open they are to the gospel. And it is in the darkness that light shines the brightest. Amen? Amen. This kind of vision only the Holy Spirit can give us. And vision is important. Every, any, anybody dieted before, as in diet to lose weight? I tried to do that numerous times. I'm still trying. <laughs> but the essence of successful dieting is vision. The essence of successful dieting is vision. Every time we try to lose weight, Instagram always know I'm trying to lose weight. And then the apps keep coming up trying to sell me some exercise apps. And you see all these fit bodies, these abs and, and all that. And, and there's this vision there. And I'm like, I can get there. I'm going to exercise like that. Not, I haven't really gotten very far. But I'm going to exercise like that. I'm going to eat like that. Like how they suggested. And so the vision keeps me in line. And then chocolate cake appears. 
and cheesecake. And then suddenly the vision of flabby arms and flabby tummy comes to me. And that vision begins to fight with the other vision. May the better vision win. Sometimes, um, I would, actually we have some jeans that are too tight, but we refuse to buy new jeans. Keep them, keep looking at them. We'll fit into that, we'll lose weight, we'll get into that. <laughs> then we are dying. <sighs> A successful reaping of the harvest requires vision. It requires vision. Proverbs 28 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. What do you see? You can see like Jesus. What do you see in your workplaces, your spheres of influence, your campus, your schools, your homes? What do you see? A couple of years back, my husband and I, we pioneered a street evangelism movement that began with 10 people and in three months became 100. We went on the streets and what we did was pray for the sick. Just pray for people by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And honestly, before we started this movement, sick people wasn't obvious to us. After we went, literally just once or twice, until today, when I go to a shopping mall, I can see a, sh a sick person from far away. It's like God reveals them to us, almost saying like, I love that person. I love that person. I love that person. He reveals that to us. This revelation doesn't come by, it doesn't come just by coming. It comes because God gives it to us. He reveals it to us. And we begin to see differently than we ever did before. What do you see? What do you see? Everyone, tell your neighbor, what do you see? Number two, what moves you? So Jesus saw the crowds and had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without shepherd. You see, Jesus didn't just see. The scripture says he had compassion on them. Something inside of him moved him. And there is a difference between pity Sympathy, empathy, and compassion. And I'm going to show you that right now. Pity and sympathy is just feeling sorry for the misfortune of others. And it ends at feelings. I'm sorry. Empathy is the ability to understand the mis misfortune of others. And it only ends at understanding. Whereas compassion... I can never pronounce this properly. How's my Greek? And it means to be moved as to one's bowels. Now's not the time to go to the toilet. It means suffering with another, sympathy or sorrow for the distress or misfortune of another with a desire to help. Which means true compassion must move you to action. It doesn't stay still. It doesn't ignore the problem. It doesn't turn away when someone is in need. It acts. Just like when, if, if you want to be, if you want to be the world's greatest singer and you're passionate about doing that, you'll do everything you can to make sure that you are the world's greatest singer. You will take those classes. You, passion, ma, that's where the word passion comes from. And in the same way, compassion, oh, it acts. There is action to compassion. In fact, many times, whenever you see this word compassion, it's never just a feeling. Jesus always did something about it. 
I'll give you some examples. Matthew 14, Jesus went forth, saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion, he healed the sick. He had compassion on the multitude who hadn't eaten, he fed them. He mo Jesus moved with compassion, he healed blind eyes, and he healed the man with leprosy. It's all in the scriptures. He always did something about it whenever he was moved. What moves you? Because there are harassed sheep, helpless sheep out there in the world, perhaps even among you, crying for help, needing leadership and guidance, somebody to tell them that there is good news. Somebody to lead them to life, to green pastures. That's what shepherds do. They lead sheep to green pastures, to life. Some time back, a friend invited my husband and I to go to a hospital to visit a boy who was about 23 years old. And this boy um, joined a company, a bogus company. The company gave him a credit card and he racked up. He racked up a bill for the company, about 20 to 30K. And then overnight, the, the company just disappeared and he was left with a debt. He was, so, he was so distressed, he went up the fourth floor of a building and he jumped. I remember that scene so well because I walked into the hospital room and his whole body was just cast, just white cast, whole body. And his eyes, there was just nothingness. His mother was beside him, he doesn't have a father. And he told the mother, even after that whole ordeal, mom, I don't want to live. I still don't want to live. My heart. My heart. My husband and I prayed for him. Tried to tell him about Jesus. Honestly, what came over us was, where were his friends? When he... When, when that happened to him, before he even jumped, where were the people to reach out to him and tell him he's somebody, that it's okay? He was going to lose his life for 30K. For some of you, it's nothing. For God, it's definitely nothing. And he, and he defined his life's worth for 30K because he doesn't know the hope and the answer that is Jesus. Where is the compassion? We lived in such a desensitized, ignorant society, self-centered even. God is calling the church to be a light of the world and the salt of the earth, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Where is the compassion? We need to offer people real answers. You see, Jesus... Gave the world spiritual solutions. We need to give the world spiritual solutions. The answer that is Jesus. We can't confine Jesus to charitable deeds alone. You see, you can give food and money and all these physical things, which are all good. But at the end of the day, if they don't have Jesus, they have nothing. We need to give an answer. We carry the answer. True compassion doesn't desire that people stay in their mess. It requires them to be set free. When our young people are hitting distress and they come to us, we affirm them for maybe just one day. And after that, we tell them, get out of it. Stop staying in that place. We love you too much to see you miss your destiny and your future. You have a hope. Get out of this and move towards your destiny. This is what Jesus did. This is what compassion is. This is what compassion looked like. Jesus going to the cross. Compassion drove him to action. He went to the cross out of love for you and me and he, and he hung on the cross and he stayed there.
Compassion lives in you and me. His name is Jesus. He is what fuels compassion and causes you to do things out of the ordinary, impossible things. Miraculous things. Do you believe it? What a good God we have. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. He's so compassionate. He never turns us away. Amen. What moves you? Third question. What will you do? What will you do? Matthew 9 verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. I want to zoom in on, on proclaim. Luke 4 says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other, other, town, other towns. Also because that is why I was sent. Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creations. The word proclaim. Everyone say proclaim. Proclaim. Proclaim what? If you, know, if you understand the root word of proclaim, pro means go forth. Claim means claim back. <laughs> Amazing. I think I had to share that in other services. But that's what it means. Proclaim what? Proclaim the good news. You see, we live in times where actually bad news sells. But deep inside, people want to hear good news. They want to hear news of redemption, of life, of joy, of hope. That is what people really, really want. Even though they're bombarded by all this bad news. It's almost like evil and hatred and all this negativity is like normal these days. But why can't righteousness, peace and joy be normal too? It's better. And he didn't just come to proclaim the good news. He came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Wow. Wow. There is power in proclamation. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. God spoke the world into creation. Think about that for a second. There's an experiment on YouTube, this video that shows two plants, that shows this guy doing an experiment on two plants. One plant, two healthy plants, and one plant, he cursed the plant. Like, curse, curse, curse the plant. The other plant, he spoke life. And the, and the plant that he cursed, it died. Disintegrated. The plant that he spoke life to, it flourished. Stayed alive. Wow. It's not a Christian thing. That's, at least that's why I say it's a scientific thing. Romans 1 verse 16 says... For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Wow. The gospel carries power. Can we show that slide? The gospel carries power, but it is activated in proclamation. We need to say something. It's got to be spoken out. But can I not just like, you know, reflect uh, God through my actions and, you know, just be a light? Yeah. That's awesome. But the real power comes in speaking out. The real power comes in proclaiming the good news. Everyone has a testimony? Amen. A testimony of salvation? I do. Everyone, everyone knows what Jesus did on the cross and what he did because of his love for us, right? Amen. We conquer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So when you share the good news, something happens in the spiritual realm. Something happens in the spiritual realm and it's not about how well you share it or how, how qualified you are to share it. Something happens when you actually speak the gospel. There's power in that. When, um, 
When I was uh, in Sri Lanka recently, Pastor Chu sent a group of pastors over to Sri Lanka, and I, I was given this uh, youth evangelistic meeting to do. And, and the youth evangelistic meeting became a multi-generational evangelistic meeting. There, there, there weren't many youths. Don't know what happened. We need to pray for Sri Lanka. All right? And, and it was a small evangelistic meeting, and I had this beautiful curated sermon. Like, ah, I got this. I'm going to be a blessing. And just before the sermon, I feel the Holy Spirit telling me, don't preach that sermon. And I'm like, God, I'm, if I don't, I don't have anything else prepared. Tell your testimony and preach the cross. I came up to the pulpit. I dumped my Bible and my sermon and I never even opened my sermon. I began to share my testimony and just preach the cross. There was a last minute translator thrown at me so my, my time was cut into half. And it was shorter and I had to concise everything and to tell people about the love of Jesus and what He did in my life. And I tell you, many got saved that day. The salvations in proportion to the number of people that were there, many got saved. 90-year-old men, really very old men, came up to the altar and got saved. This is like almost the end of his life. And I'm like, my heart was like, honestly, before that, I was wrestling. I said, do you know this church that we went to, they, they deal with, with, with orphans who are dumped. They, they, there's a lot of baby dumping in Sri Lanka. So they deal with all these orphans who have been rejected. And, and, and so everybody, very drama one, their story. I was like, God, how does my story match up? Not even close to what they go through. But God says, no, there's power in proclamation. You just tell your story because your story is His story. 25th anniversary promo. Your story is important to God. It has value. It will make a difference in someone's life. There was a healing evangelist who had a great testimony. He was a drug addict. And he shared his testimony. And this guy was so impacted by his testimony. Somebody in the congregation ran up to him and said, wow, your testimony is, is amazing. I wish I was a drug addict. <laughs> and the healing evangelist looks at him and goes, dude, believe me, you don't want to be one. Your story is important. Tell your neighbor, your story is important to God. Glory. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Has, past tense. You are already anointed. You are chosen. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation meant to call out people from darkness into His marvelous light. You are not an anointed couch potato. <laughs> You're anointed to act. Anointed to preach. Anointed to set people free. Set the captives free. Come on, let's say hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Everyone say, preach the simple gospel. The gospel is so simple, that's not complicated. It's so simple and it's so powerful. Everyone say, heal the sick. Jesus called. Sorry, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So Jesus wasn't just all talk. He demonstrated the kingdom and He demonstrated it powerfully. You see, the kingdom is not just meant to be talked about, it's meant to be experienced. 
That's why it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is experience. See is perception. When we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is, heaven, as it is in heaven. We are asking for the kingdom to be manifested on earth through our lives. And as we pray for the sick, we invite the presence of God into this situation and God can answer it. I'll continue a little bit and I'll, I'll, and I'll expound. Matthew 10 verse 1 says that he gave 12 disciples, he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And I'm going to jump right to verse 7. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Wait, let me stop there. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Some versions say at hand. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Where's my hand? Here. It's within my grasp. That's how near it is. And then he begins to give, he begins to tell the disciples, this is how you can show them what it looks like. What my kingdom looks like. It's right here. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. By the way, it's a command. Sometimes when people, when people make maybe, you know, uh, statements like, uh, oh, you know, uh, yesterday Wayan healed the sick. And, and somebody responds, oh! no, 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 Wayan didn't heal the sick. Sorry, I'm just using Wayan's name for example, okay? No, Wayan didn't heal the sick. It was Jesus who healed the sick. Yeah, that's true. But Jesus said, heal the sick. You heal the sick. Jesus says, you cast out the demons. For example, depression is a demon, by the way. It's a spirit. He says, you go and heal the sick. I'm going to show you a picture in a bit. I'm going to give you some background story. Is that okay? Um, just a few years back, this is before... My husband and I got a revelation of healing. Um, we were in Cameron Highlands. We were on a retreat. And, you know, we, we do that yearly. We, to seek the Lord, ask for direction, just be with God, you know. And I was in a garden and I was worshipping God in the garden. And, you know, in the middle of my worshipping, suddenly this bee, or rather actually it's a hornet, this flying object comes and hits me right in the head. Suddenly, I feel this pain. I've been stung by a hornet. I stood up. I ran into the house. And I was like, Mike, I think I got stung. And my husband, being wonderfully sensitive, goes, oh my gosh, what is God saying? <laughs> God must be saying something, Tabby. I said, Mike, I have no time for this right now. It really is hurting. It's painful. I guess, okay, 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 okay. I said, come, let's go doctor. So we go to the doctor in Cameron Highlands and, and you know, the, the only doctor for miles, actually. Not many doctors there. And, and there's a lot of patients. By the time it got to us, we got in. There were still a lot of patients there. And we didn't even end up talking about my sting much. We were talking to this doctor for like half an hour. He kept us there for half an hour telling us about his religion, his life, his family, and there were, there were patients waiting outside. Phone calls were coming in, and he was like, yeah, okay, later, bam. And we were like, okay. So we decided, you know what, Holy Spirit, you must be saying something right here. We're going to share the gospel. So we shared the gospel. We told him about the love of Jesus. We blessed him. And, you know, he didn't receive Jesus. But as we got out of the doctors, we were like, whoa, God, did you, did you, did you let me get stung by a bee for that? And then, my, and then my husband goes, we need to check for the word sting in the Bible. <laughs> oh, death, where is your sting? <laughs> yeah, 
I'm serious. We actually went there and I was like, wow, God, Pharaoh, that is your sting. I came out of the retreat. We left Cameron's. We were filled with the Spirit. We were just being with God. We were like, we were quite blessed. You know, even though I was stung and I was in pain and on allergy pills, we were blessed. We were like, wow, praise the Lord. I felt the Holy Spirit was just there with me. I could hear His voice. We went back to my mother's house and, you know, found out that, that her maid had lesions on her skin. And it was stopping her from working. I like literally open wounds, like a skin disease. It's not eczema, it's worst. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, pray for her. See, this was the beginning of God giving us revelation of healing. And, and I was like, you know what, Mike? I feel I need to pray for her. So I prayed for her, commanded it, commanded the, 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 the skin to be well. And immediately there was a cold wind that went through her, her hands. Cold wind that went through her hands. And I said, how can you test it? Oh, if I put it under running water, it's usually super painful. I can't even work. So I said, go test it. She puts it under the running water and the pain is completely gone. I want to show you this picture. We managed to take a picture. We don't always get to take pictures. And so it was a, can we show the picture please? Thank you. Thank you. 21st of October, when we prayed for her, you know, that was the condition of her hands. I know it's really hard to see. You can come and see me and I can show it to you. But in seven days, her lesions completely healed and, and cleared up. Come on, what do we give glory to Jesus? And on the same day, two other people would come to the house, to my mother's house. I prayed for one of them and the other one, didn't, I didn't get to pray for, but I got a word of knowledge for that person. The other person got healed. I managed to pray for that person. I tell you, God was, God is just amazing. And from there, I got a revelation of healing like never before. And of course, there were many other instances that would be too long to share today. But I'm going to show you another picture during our street evangelism time. When we were with our young people, can we show the picture please? So this was a man on the streets that our young people, not me, the young people were praying for. He had a broken hand here, like in this area, you can see that, right? And um, they prayed for him. Nothing happened at first. And after 10 minutes of persistence, whoa, his hand straightened out. Now, let me tell you, this is a really rare picture because when we are out on street evangelism, we usually don't take photos because it's not polite, right? You know, we, I mean, you pray for people. Oh, can I take your photo? No, you can't do that, you know? So this was one of those rare situations where they were in a group and somebody managed to take a photo. And, and honestly, we have people who come out on the streets, see healing, see deaf ears open, see people walk and stuff like that. And they still, right, can rationalize one still don't believe. They see, but they still don't believe. So the saying, the saying, the saying that, oh, I see only I believe, is not true. <laughs> These people still don't believe. But you can choose to believe or not to believe, doesn't mean it didn't happen. We believe, then we will see. Believe, then we will see. I know what I'm talking about. We did this for a year and a half. We saw people walk out of wheelchairs, remove their, what do you call those things? Clutches. We've seen people transform in a heart, cry before our eyes and receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. We've seen the reality of Jesus. You can choose to believe or not to believe. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. I know what I saw and this is the reality that I carry with me every single day. Every single day when I'm out and about, when I am even in, when I'm in the service with LifeGen, we see miracles, we see wonders at every service. Big or small, doesn't matter. We still see it. This is how I want to live. 
I want to live in response to the Father. I want to live with this reality of the kingdom in my life always. But I'm not worthy. I, I don't think I can do this. I'm not qualified. You know, I'm not a healing evangelist. I'm not that kind of I'm not you. I'm going to show you a scripture that's going to blow your mind. And usually we skip this scripture. Matthew 10, verse 2 to 4. And so Jesus gave authority to all his disciples and he names these 12 apostles. And guess who he also gives authority to? Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Talk about someone who is not worthy. Would you give authority to somebody who will betray you? But Jesus, he gave them authority to heal, to heal sickness and diseases. He gave you authority to heal sickness and diseases. You carry the presence of God. He who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Hear me and hear me well. You have authority. Tell your neighbor you have authority. You have authority. You have authority to change lives. I've been healed with hypothyroid twice. I had hypothyroid. First time, I went to a conference, healing rally, got healed. The second time, symptoms came back and I felt it coming back. But this time, I had a revelation of healing. And so I commanded the thyroid to be well in Jesus' name. Symptoms, you will not get the better of me. We need to speak the goal in the face of darkness. We need to speak life and hope in the face of darkness. Do you understand? We need to learn to call out the goal in the situation. That's why Pastor Nietzsche always asks us, declare scripture over yourself. Speak life over yourself. Stop reacting to the darkness. You believe the lie, you empower the liar. You believe the truth, you empower the truth. You empower Jesus. Glory to God. Shakariya, pariya, pariya, sekiriya. We are carriers of the presence of God. And there is an urgency. There is an urgency. I'm going to show you this scripture. Jesus says it's an urgency. Can I see the scripture, please? He said to another man, follow me. Jesus said to another man. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. One might ask, what's wrong with going to bury my father? I need to honour my father, right? Especially in this Asian society, we need to honour our parents. But actually, the scripture doesn't say when the father died. It doesn't say that. So we don't know. But Jesus is essentially saying, the time is now. No procrastination, no delay. Let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God because you are alive. And it's now. That's why the scripture says now is the day of God's favor. Now is the time of salvation. Now. It's urgent. And I'm going to close. What will you do? Will you co-labor with God in His redemption purposes on this earth? By the way, He is the Lord of the harvest. Which means He saves. So when we say go and make disciples, some people like to say we're not here to make converts, we're here to make disciples. I agree and I disagree. Because actually, Jesus is the one that saves. Jesus is the one that makes the converts because he's the Lord of the harvest. But we need to go and proclaim the kingdom. Somebody needs to go and deliver the good news. You see, good news isn't news unless it is delivered. It needs to be delivered to be news. It's a 
He is the Lord of the harvest. He does the conversion. We go, we tell people, He does the conversion, and we make those disciples. Glory to God. And the field belongs to Him. It's His harvest field. So we're just claiming back what is ours. What is His, sorry. I'm going to close right now. And I really ask you all to, to try not to leave. Not because I, I'm trying to stop you, but because this is a really holy moment. This is a really a time where God wants to speak to each and every one of us. I was in Christ for All Nations in the USA in January. And my husband and I got selected to attend this evangelistic conference to train evangelists. And we had the privilege of meeting probably one of the greatest evangelists of our time, Reinhard Bonnke, who has led over 70 million to the Lord. Now he's got a successor, but he's still preaching the gospel on Facebook. He's 80 over years old. has led 70 million to the Lord in his lifetime. Only because he obeyed a call God had for him for a blood-washed Africa. And when I was there, he shared with us something that shook me, really, really shook me in the inside. He said, if you won't do what God's calling you to do, He will find somebody who will. God has replacements. He shared that some years after his calling, he was out in the African crusade and he heard of another evangelist ministry in town and he was excited. He was a great evangelist. He went over there to say hi and found out that this evangelist had already dropped his ministry. And he found out that this evangelist dropped his ministry in Africa in 1972, the year that he was called. He believes that God chose him to replace the other person. Esau, the firstborn in the family, he should have been the one God would fulfill the great promise. But Esau, he passed over that birthright and God chose. He gave it to Jacob. And Jacob inherited the destiny. You see, if you don't want to honor the calling on your life, God will choose someone who will. Saul was supposed to be chosen king. His line was supposed to be the line. But he rebelled. And God chose David as king. You see, God's plan will still come to pass whether you choose or not choose to be a part of it. He can raise up the next world changer overnight. He took Esther from the gutter and he put her in a palace. If not you, then who? Who will do it? You have a choice. You have a purpose to propel God's kingdom forward and He will hold us eternally accountable. Church, hear me. The times are urgent. You have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. The church is not a pleasure boat. It's a lifeboat and we need all hands on deck. The church who doesn't win the lost is lost itself. He wasn't just raised on a cross just to raise our standard of living. He was raised on a cross to save the lost and we have an obligation to go. What do you see? What moves you? And what will you do? He has placed you where you are, your workplace, the marketplace, your schools, your campus, wherever you are, He's placed you there for a reason. We need to start, we need to stop looking at our issues and our problems and stop being distracted and begin to see the vision God wants to place over us. Begin to open our eyes and see the harvest is plentiful. And we need to proclaim and we need to show compassion. Some years back, Back in the early days when LifeGen started, there was a lot less campus students. The Lord told me, I, 
that because I was asking him, how do I grow them? He was like, go to them. And after I got the revelation of healing, he told me to proclaim and declare over them that they would heal the sick, cast out demons, and preach the gospel. I was like, okay. I remember I went into one of the services that we were at, and they look a bit blur, you know, like, you know, blur. And I said, Life Gen, you will heal the sick, cast out demons, and preach the gospel. I declare that. And though they were white eyed, they were like, What in the world is she talking about? Today, I have a group of young people I'm so blessed to call my family. And I am so proud of their compassion. I'm so proud. I see, I see Wen Xiang. He's a teacher. He just, he prayed. He prayed for, for one of his students who had a mismatched length in his leg. And the, he prayed and he, and, he, and he grew out. And all the students came and was like, teacher, teacher, teacher. Did that really happen? You see, the world, the world is looking for God. The world is crying out for God. And we got to wake up. We got to wake up, church. I declare, you will heal the sick. I declare, you will cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. In Jesus' name, I declare it. It's going to be a powerful church. SIBKL is a powerful church. This is my heart. Last year at Fire Festival, when we had our evangelistic meeting, we saw healing signs and wonders. Our 200 people, only 200, we about 200 over people, brought 1,300 over people to an evangelistic meeting. That cannot happen just because I asked them. It happens because of revelation. Carol brought 40 friends. One person brought 40 friends. God can use anyone. Next week, if all of you brought four friends, 4,000 brought four friends, be 16,000 in our church overnight. But can we see? Do we have a revelation of the vision God has placed? The calling, you see, SIBKL is not a monument, it's a movement. And the Holy Spirit is speaking. We got to wake up. Don't get comfortable. Comfortable people cannot grow. Jesus, why don't we all bow our heads? We're slightly over time, but this is so important. Jesus, God. Holy Spirit I feel like God is giving visions now to people putting people's faces God's giving you people's faces people in your office people in your sphere of influence maybe He's given you a picture of I don't know financing the kingdom I don't know but God wants to use you. Oh, the Holy Spirit. If today you heard my message and you're saying, God, yes, I am willing. I am not qualified. I am not perfect but I am willing to be a voice for my generation. I don't have it all together. I don't even have the right words to speak. Will you use me, God? If that is in your heart, I want to give you a chance to respond to this. And you are saying, yes, God, I am willing. I don't have it all together, but I am willing because God is looking for your yes. That's all He's looking for. And He will lead you and He will guide you. And if you're saying, yes, 
I am willing, God, use me. Can you just stand wherever you are, representing your marketplace, your school, your campus, wherever it is. If you're saying, yes, God, here am I, send me. Holy Spirit. Jesus. Shakariri. Yes, Lord. Lord, you see every person standing right now and you hear their prayers, you hear the desires of their hearts. Father, right now I declare their eyes be open in Jesus' name. Father, I speak an activation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Activate them, Lord, according to your will and purposes. Align them, Lord. Move them, Lord, with compassion. Heal. Bring them, Lord, to a place where they have a revelation of your compassion. Father, I speak boldness and courage in Jesus' name. I declare nothing, no fear will hold them back. Because, Lord, they'll be motivated by love. And perfect love casts out all fear. Jesus, give them courage to step out and reach out to someone to pray for someone, to show compassion to someone so that people can see your glory, O oh God. People can see that you are Lord and Savior.